Uh, as many of you already know, uh, I'm Sung Han Shin. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of uh, uh, Korean culture and cinema uh, in the Department of uh, East Asian Languages and Literatures. And uh, uh, first, I want to thank uh, the speakers uh, who uh, kindly agreed to come to uh, Pitt uh, to give uh, talks and uh, discussion about North Korean art and uh, literature. And uh, I want to also uh, thank uh, some organizations uh, that made this uh, event possible. Uh, the Korea Foundation, the Year of Pitt Global Program, China Council, Japan Council, and uh, East Asian Library at uh, Hillman. Uh, uh, their generous uh, donations and uh, financial support uh, were uh, indispensable to make this uh, event happen, so I'm uh, really grateful to them. And I also uh, very much appreciate uh, the Asian Studies Center's uh, staff. Uh, they are wonderful people, and uh, without them, without their, uh, you know, uh, wonderful work, uh, we couldn't be here today. So uh, I uh, want to thank uh, the Asian Studies set, uh, staff. Uh, so uh, uh, let me give you a few words about the uh, speakers uh, we have today. Uh, first professor, uh, Bee Ji Moon, uh, is here. And uh, he's a visual artist and teaches uh, painting in the Department of uh, Art and Art History at uh, Georgetown University. Uh, his achievement has been widely recognized through uh, solo exhibitions in venues like uh, Stocks Gallery in Chelsea in New York City, Ilmin Museum of Art in Seoul, and the American University Museum in Washington, D.C. For his professional achievements and uh, artistic merits, uh, Professor Moon has been awarded numerous times uh, including the Mary, uh, Maryland State Art Council's Individual Artist Award and the first place award in the uh, Beth uh, Painting Award competitions. And his artwork has been collected in museums and galleries, including the National Museum of Modern Art uh, in Korea. And uh, reviews on his work and uh, his interviews have been featured in uh, the New York Times and Art in America and CNN as well. In addition to actively um, showing his artwork, Professor Moon has also taken an interest in and studied North Korean art. So uh, he is not just a painter, uh, he is a researcher uh, on North Korean art. Uh, and uh, he has made uh, multiple research uh, yeah, uh, he has made uh, multiple research trips to Pyongyang during the past uh, seven years or so and conducted interviews of artists and art historians and museum staff by visiting the Joseon uh, National Art Museum and other national art exhibitions as well as uh, Manste Art Studio. He has given talks and lectures on North Korean art at various venues including Georgetown, Johns Hopkins, Columbia, and Harvard University. Uh, his research on North Korean uh, art culminated uh, in a recent book, Pyongyang Art, Uncovering the Complex Layers of uh, Joseon Hwa, which was published last year. Uh, English translation is not yet available, but uh, is in progress right now. Uh, so uh, his book uh, will be available soon. Uh, and prof uh, oh, I forgot the book. <laughs> I forgot to show you the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is the book uh, uh, published by um, the Korea Selection. It's a Korean language uh, book. Uh, but uh, I read book and I really, uh, I was really impressed by um, his uh, his knowledge about uh, North Korean uh, paintings, but uh, also by uh, his writing style. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, uh, we have this book in our library. So, uh, uh, for those who can read uh, Korean, I strongly recommend this book to you. 
Okay, and uh, Professor Moon was currently chosen as curator of, not, uh, not currently, oh, sorry. Last year, last year, Professor Moon was uh, chosen as curator of uh, the Gwangju Biennale for North Korean Art Exhibition. In addition, he was appointed as a Maryland Art Council by the governor in October 2017. So, uh, uh, and uh, after introducing uh, Professor Kim, uh, we can welcome uh, them. Uh, so, Professor uh, Emmanuel Kim. Uh, second time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, here. Okay. Uh, professor Emmanuel Kim is Korea Foundation and Kim Luno Professor of uh, Korean Literature and Cultural uh, Studies. Uh, uh, at uh, uh, George Washington University. Uh, he holds his PhD from the University of California, Riverside. Uh, prior to working at the George Washington University, he was assistant professor in the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies at uh, SUNY Binghamton. Uh, he's a specialist in North Korean literature and cinema. Uh, his research uh, focuses on the evolution of North Korean literature from the 1960s to present day, particularly changes in the representations of uh, women's sexuality and memory. His work appeared in uh, various prestigious journals, including Talos, the Journal of Korean Studies, and the Journal of uh, Japanese and Korean Cinema. His recent book, Rewriting uh, Revolution, Women, Sexuality, and Memory in North Korean Fiction came out last year, and uh, it explores the complex and dynamic uh, literary culture that has deeply impacted uh, the North Korean society. His current research is also very interesting. It's on North Korean uh, comedic poems and the ways in which humor has been an integral component of the everyday life in North Korea. By exploring uh, comedy films and uh, comedians, uh, Dr. Kim uh, looks past the ostensible propaganda and examines the agents of uh, left. Uh, so, um, uh, this um, you know a short uh, uh, biography uh, tells a lot about the two speakers we have today. And uh, I think uh, they truly deserve to be called uh, trailblazers in uh, scholarship on North Korea. So uh, I think uh, uh, we have a rare opportunity to uh, be, uh, you know, uh, well informed of uh, uh, North Korean society, North Korean culture, and North Korean art. So uh, please uh, join me welcoming. Uh, Professor Moon and Professor Kim uh, with a big uh, of course, uh, big round of applause. So yeah. All right. Thank you very much for inviting me. Wow, it's the first time in Pittsburgh. I've heard so much about it, uh, and it's, it's so beautiful uh, driving over here from the airport. Um, and I'm, I'm expecting the uh, nightlife to be even better. Uh, hearing that the lights are just amazing. But we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, well, I want to thank Professor Shin for inviting me, uh, for inviting us. Um, it's a nice 50-minute air flight from DC. Very easy in and out. Um, just, just a wonderful experience here so far. And I want to thank the uh, Asian Center uh, for uh, hosting this event. Uh, I met Professor Shin about two years ago, I think, over at Cornell. There was a co we were uh, at a conference together, and uh, he pulled me to the side and he said, you know, over at the University of Pittsburgh, we have a lot of North Korean materials. I said, at University of Pittsburgh? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, I see this flyer, and it says you guys have over 80 Titles, three thousand different. What is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, just a lot, um, and so many films as well. So I'm thinking, wow, what a great place to be in terms of tapping into uh, resources in North Korean uh, culture. 
So hopefully, some of the things I talk about today, you will have in your collection. I mean, that would be great. Uh, unfortunately, though, most of these are not translated. Some of the films have subtitles, but not all of them. So, uh, but you can, you can enjoy the images. How about that? Yes, if you don't know Korean. Um, and it's always a pleasure for me to uh, talk about North Korean literature. That, that is my starting point. Um, that's what I started with in, in terms of my uh, PhD research. I moved on to cinema, but it's always a pleasure to talk about uh, literature. So, I don't know what you guys know or have uh, some kind of inkling of, of North Korean literature, but uh, here I'll just give you guys a pretty standard layout uh, and trajectory of most of uh, a lot of these uh, different forms of literature. So in North Korea, literature as politics, right? I mean, uh, you can't get away from that. It's very political. Um, and why not, right? I mean, they want to uh, inform the people of what is happening in the state. They want to keep them aware of what's happening around the world. And so everything that you encounter in North Korea has an element of politics in it. So let's look at the first one. Literature typically has, or at least th these are some of our assumptions, literature uh, glorifies the leaders. Uh, I've met so many people who say, wow, you know, how can you read thousands of uh, short stories, novels, that all have to do uh, with the leaders? I'll get to that in a second, but that's, that is a common assumption. The literature in North Korea glorifies the leaders. All three Kims, Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and now Kim Jong-un. The second assumption is that the literature is like a mouthpiece of the uh, party directives. So whatever the party says, it's delivered and manifested in the literature. Going down the list, if you guys don't know what Juche literature is, Juche is the official uh, ideology in North Korea. Uh, there is this huge, uh, it looks like a Washington Monument, but it's slightly taller than the Washington Monument, and it's called the Juche Tower, and it stands right in the middle of the city. Um, Juche is the official ideology, and what Juche is all about is self-reliance. North Korea says, hey, you got to be the master of your own life, your own world, therefore, uh, instead of being dependent on bigger powers, you have to be dependent on yourself, independent of these foreign powers. So the assumption is, oh, the literature in North Korea is all about the official ideology. Some of the recurring themes in North Korean literature is the anti-Japanese theme and the anti-American theme. The anti-Japanese theme comes from Kim Il-sung's revolutionary history during the colonial period. In the 30s, uh, Kim Il-sung assembled a group of workers, guerrilla members, to fight against the Japanese. And because of that, uh, it's been memorialized and repeated in the literature. So when you read through it, and the memory takes you back to uh, the anti-Japanese uh, theme, that's because they want to glorify the leader. And that's just another way of doing it. The anti-American theme is, is more recent. Uh, in the sense that, of course, during the Korean War in 1953, uh, 1950, sorry, uh, there was this heavy sentiment of anti-Americanism. But this theme is currently going on in the sense that, well, the relationship between North Korea and the United States is not good. And after what happened to Hanoi, uh, God, I don't know uh, what kind of literature North Koreans will produce. Right? Uh, they, they probably feel a little backstabbed, a little betrayed, uh, they thought some, something's going to happen, and nothing came out of this uh, recent summit. So I'm assuming literature will, uh, the, the theme in uh, the literature would be, again, heavily anti-American. Again, these are assumptions. When we think of North Korea, it's all propaganda, and the state drills propaganda into the people, and that's all they receive. And it's a bit of a shame that this assumption is in our head, right? Because 
North Korean literature is rather diverse. The, the list I put up here is just a very minimal list here. So aside from your short story, novella, and novels, uh, there are a lot of no, uh, romance novels. And the most representative of those romance novels is a novel called Hymn of Youth. I hope you guys have this in your uh, collection because uh, this was like a bestseller in North Korea. Yes, bestseller. People actually go and read it, uh, share uh, the novel together. Um, you know, during the Q&A I can answer some of the questions on, um, on the distribution and, and whatnot. But uh, this was a, one of the bestsellers. Uh, a story about a, a man and a woman deeply in love. Right? This is a heated romance here. Right? Uh, but we'll get into that in a second. There are tons of detective novels. North Koreans eat this stuff up. They love detective novels. But this shouldn't be surprising, right? Because uh, Americans or even Euro uh, excuse me, <coughs> Europeans love this kind of action thriller, right? We're all into that in Hollywood. Uh, like, how many Mission Impossible uh, movies can there be? Right? How many more can Tom Cruise make, right? Um, but before that, 007, big hit in Europe, right? Uh, and in the United States. So, detective action movie, uh, novels, big hit in North Korea. Science fiction is another one. That's huge. It has a completely different section in its library. They have a hu huge museum based on um, uh, technology or whatnot. And it's devoted to this kind of exploration of the world beyond ours. And the North Koreans love that. Uh, the next biggest one is children's novels. Uh, a huge genre where it ranges from cartoons, comic books, to you know, uh, youth uh, <coughs> novels. And then historical novels. This is an interesting one. North Koreans love uh, to sort of trace their history back to, I don't know, 3,000 years, 4,000 years. Um, the most popular one, I would say, is Hong Jin, which was published in 2002. And of all the historical novels that I've read in North Korea, this is probably the most erotic novel. Uh, because Hong Jin is, is what Koreans would say, Kiseng, uh, a courtesan. And the author goes really deep into the sexual sort of uh, event <coughs> that she performs on her customers. It's very erotic, very detailed. And you're thinking, well, how could such eroticism exist in North Korea when they're supposed to be prude, when they're supposed to be clean and only devote their life to the leader? How could such literature exist? Well, it does. I, I, mean, I, I don't know what else to say, right? Uh, in other words, we've got to start breaking away our assumption uh, about North Korean literature. Um, in 2015, I visited Pyongyang, uh, not as a tourist this time, uh, I went there uh, in 2008 uh, as a tourist, but in 2015, I visited Pyongyang again, uh, solely to do research, <coughs> and I somehow got in touch with one of my favorite North Korean writers, and we sat and we had a nice discussion. Uh, our meeting was only supposed to be scheduled for one day, but it turned out to be three days. We had lunch, dinner, uh, we played table tennis together, a pool, and we even went to the karaoke bar. Uh, <coughs> writers, much like any, uh, any other writers around the world, they love to talk. Writers love to talk. And if you ever sit down with a writer, give them a few uh, glasses of beer, they will just keep running their mouth. And that's why my time with this writer was just invaluable. Uh, and this was sort of the beginnings of, uh, his novel was sort of the beginning of my love interest with North Korean literature. Because when I first started off in my research, I was in South Korea, uh, in the North Korean library there, and I opened up uh, Joseon Munak, which is Korean literature. I'm sure you guys have Joseon Munak in your uh, collection. And every month, uh, they have about three to four or five, sometimes five stories, short stories. So I decided to sit down. I started with 1960s. I, don't ask me why I started with 1960s. It's very arbitrary, right? I just sat down, opened up 1960s, January 1960. 
I started reading the literature. Uh, so you can imagine three, four stories, let's just say three, uh, in, in a year, uh, that's 36 stories. I read from 1960s, 70s, 80s, so three decades of uh, these short stories. Close to a thousand stories. After a while, your eyes, at least my eyes, started getting really blurry. I was losing hope. Because everything looked exactly like the other story. In fact, what it looked like was the writers just changed the name from Kim to Lee. Instead of Comrade Kim, it was Comrade Lee. I swear it's the same story. And I'm looking, wait, hold on, it's a deja vu. Continuous deja vu. I swear I read this story. So I started losing hope, and I went to my advisor in Korea, and I said, look, buddy, I, I don't know, the North Korean stuff, I, I don't think this is for me. Right? They all look the same to me. And he told me, you know what, just be patient with North Korean literature. I know they all look the same, but if you actually read closely, they're not. So I went back to it, and I started reading novels uh, of all kinds, all these different genres. Uh, and I found one novel that I really, really fell in love with. So here's the list. The first novel right there is Friend by Bing Nam Yong. He's the author that I met in Pyongyang in 2015. And it's about divorce. The first two pages, it already started differently. A woman is in a court or in an office uh, with a judge petitioning to file a divorce with her husband. And that sort of caught my eye. And I continue to read that book. And I just completely loved it. And I decided to translate that novel. So right now, uh, Columbia University Press is working on translating, and hopefully it'll come out in fall of this year. <clears throat> the next story is a short story by Peck, same author. And it's about bribing University Admissions Dean. This was really interesting. So we're talking about uh, elite you know, cadres, or bureaucratic uh, officials, whose kid did not score so high on the SATs, could not get into the university. But because the father or mother has political power, uh, that person was trying to bribe the university admissions dean to say, hey, you know, my, my daughter wants to come to your university. How about you, uh, you let her in? And this is kind of pressure that the dean receives. And he's contemplating, he's, he's deciding, what should I do? And his ethics is on the line. Very interesting story. Uh, I'm going to come back to this story because there's a great anecdote. Uh, the next one is Kang bong uh, story called Female Supervisor. Kang bong is a very interesting female writer because typically she writes about the Korean War. A lot of her characters are women. A lot of the women writers uh, uh, sort of characterize women as their heroes or heroine. Uh, and Kang is typically known to write about wartime stories. And let me tell you something, I hate wartime stories. Okay. Uh, of all the stories, there's the farm agriculture story where you know, farmers wake up, you know, uh, they, 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 they work the field, um, they get into a little argument, then they make up, oh yes, and then, and then that's the end of the story. That's pretty boring. But wartime stories are really boring. <laughs> because, number one, I've never served in the military, uh, in the Korean military, uh, nor in the US military. So uh, my relationship with the military is very, very far. And the problem with the military, or in these uh, military stories, is that you know, they have all these ranks. I can't even tell you what the ranks are in the, in, in the U.S. Army or in the Marine Corps. Right? I don't know what the ranks are. So you got this like, you know, second lieutenant, colonel, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know what they call each other. So I'm reading this novel or these short stories and they, all these ranks come out. And it bores the hell out of me, right? So I'm just like, wow, you know, military stories, wartime stories are not for me, right? Uh, so she typically writes about war, but in 1992, she decided to write about a female supervisor who basically deserts her family to, to focus on her work. And her husband gets upset and says, look, you're the woman. You should stay at home. 
and then they get into this big fight. Who says that a woman should stay at home? And so it's all about this woman in the workplace uh, uh, struggling to do this dual, um, dual job of, of raising the kids and performing well in the workplace. A very famous writer in North Korea who recently passed away is Han Bin. It's, uh, it's called Lucky Day. And this is bribing for apartments. Now, this is really interesting because the government typically gives you, in North Korea, uh, typically gives you uh, apartments. And that's it. And if you want to move, uh, there's no real real estate going on in North Korea, although that's changing today. But uh, typically, you have to bribe each other. And so the main character in the story uh, wants, uh, wants to get her, his daughter a new apartment uh, because she's getting married. So he's bribing people to get her the nicest and the most uh, new uh, apartment. Fascinating, right? I mean, uh, if you guys watch South Korean dramas, right, uh, when the daughter or son gets married, uh, the gifts exchanged between the two families is typically like cars, clothes, apartments, and so forth, right? All these gift exchanges. And that's exactly what North Korea is doing as well. Kim hye is a female writer. 2004, she writes a short story called The Key, and it's about marital problems and prison camp. Yes, North Koreans talk about prison camps in their own story, right? Uh, so that's a fascinating short story as well. And the reason uh, the husband went to prison camp was during the arduous march in the uh, mid-90s when there was a huge famine and flooding and starvation going on in North Korea. People were scrambling to get some kind of cash, right? And because the public distribution system, the food, uh, rationing of food, the government giving you food, uh, since that pretty much broke down, individuals had to find their own way to support their family. So the husband in the story stole gasoline from a tractor to purchase food. Now, in and of itself, that's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that because he's trying to support his own family who's starving. But it's a crime in North Korea to steal from public property. So that's why he went to prison camp. But the fact that they divulge this kind of reality, right? The, the, the struggles that people were going through during that time is fascinating. In other words, yes, there's censorship, but there's still truth-telling as well. Finally, Kang Gui Mi is another uh, female uh, writer who's, who's uh, a Zainichi. So Korean, who was born in Japan, raised in Japan, and later came to Korea, North Korea. And a lot of her stories, in fact, all of her stories, take place in Japan. And this is about struggling North Korean actors in Japan. And for those who don't know, uh, there's a huge community of Koreans in Japan uh, who are very devoted to North Korea because uh, back in the days, uh, when, the, when the Korean community in Japan wanted funding for schools, for um, uh, restaurants, uh, whatnot. Uh, they were trying to build this community in Japan. They asked both South Korea and North Korea, and guess who uh, offered their uh, hand? It was North Korea, because North Korea at the time was living better than South Korea. So they were able to fund these people in Japan. They built a, uh, they built a university there, and all these schools. And if you attend those schools, then you use the same textbooks, that the North Koreans use. Yes, they have the photos of the great leaders up on the wall, and they sing the songs, they watch the movies, and so forth. So they're basically North Koreans, educated and, and, and trained like the North Koreans. So Kang Gui Mi is a, is a female writer who wrote this uh, story about Koreans struggling to live in Japan because of racism and because of uh, poverty. The idea is, in North Korea, yes, we're aware of this kind of political censorship. That writers should not write about certain things. Uh, they should be careful not to say what they, um, anything that goes against the government. Sure. So when I interviewed this writer, Ping Nam Yong, <coughs> prior to going to North Korea, I submitted about 50, 52 questions uh, you know, the questions that are, I was going to ask him when I'm there. Um, and the Ministry of Culture took a look at it and said, uh, you know, they had to kind of 
overlook it and, and see if these questions were not too political, right? It, I'm, am I going to ask the writers, what do you think about Kim Jong-un? You know, no, you know, they, they wanted to censor certain things, right? But my questions were very, very uh, innocent. I basically asked him, well, the typical questions, when were you born, where were you born, who was your father, mother, do you have any siblings, uh, and so forth. But I also asked him, what were your favorite novels when you, when you were growing up? What kind of stories did you read? Especially as a writer. And surprisingly, these writers read Western texts. They love Western texts. European. Now, they, uh, it has to be European, not American. And what's interesting is they consider Edgar Allan Poe to be British. Uh, because they don't want to say, they don't want to admit that he's American, because Americans are the enemy. So uh, there was a long list. Oh, so when I met with him, he printed out, he typed up his answers, printed them out, and gave them to me. Uh, and I translated that, and I published it in the Journal of Korean Studies. Um, and it's just fascinating how these writers love to read Western texts. I asked, I asked him about his first love. Who was your first girlfriend? I asked him about his wife, his children. And then I started asking him about his stories. Like, what inspires you to write these stories? Uh, how do you come up with these ideas? <clears throat> and then I asked him, not to be too political, but I, I do ask him certain questions about, hey, what's your daily uh, uh, work life like? You know, what do you do every day when you go there? What do you do? What do you think about your work? And a lot of the so-called political questions that I've asked, his response was like a sentence or two long. But regarding his personal life, he went on for pages and pages. And I realized, ah, I see. So these writers, they love to talk about their own life. Aside from what's happening in the, in the political world, their personal life. Their, their real like human values are something that they really love to express. And when we met together and had lunch and dinner, that's all we talked about. We joked about his, his childhood and so forth. Going back to life, which is the second story, this is really fascinating because uh, he submitted, or, or the editor for Chosun Munak, the leading journal for Korean uh, literature, asked Peck to submit this story to the journal. So he did. And the editor looked at it and said, this is a terrible short story. And Peck, Peck was a little offended, so he said, fine, if you don't want it, I'm not going to submit it to this journal. I don't care how prestigious this journal is. So he held back. And then some other editor was, was uh, compiling an anthology. And he asked this guy, do you have any short story that you would like to share? He said, yeah, I have this life. How about this? You know, he submitted that. And the editor thought this was a wonderful story. And so submitted it to the anthology. And it became a hit overnight. And to this day, at Kim Il-sung University, in the literature department, you have to read life. It's almost like Shakespeare. Right? You have to read this. Um, and I thought that was a very interesting anecdote because you think that uh, the party tells the writers what to write about. And that's all they do. They just write and they're just carbon copies of every other story. This is not true. Uh, there is movement and pushing the limits of creativity in North Korean literature as well. So then, going back to all those short stories that looked exactly the same to me, what was going on? Well, I realized that a lot of the, a lot of the short stories that seemed to repeat itself and have the same sort of template, I realized that it was in the 70s. And what happened in the 70s was, well, 1967 was the turning point in North Korean culture. Prior to 1967, writers were very creative in the way they wrote their stories. Uh, they really pushed the limits of their artistry. But 1967, and I'm going to blame this on Kim Jong-un, and I, I, I can say this because he's dead. So I'm going to blame it on Kim Jong-un. He single-handedly orchestrated this whole movement in North Korea that called on the writers, artists, uh, 
uh, filmmakers, to glorify the leaders. And he even wrote books on how to do it. <laughs> and this is really puzzling. This was puzzling to a lot of the writers who sort of had the freedom to write about what they wanted to write. And also now they have to include Kim Il-sung in the story. That's just weird. Right? So if you read through a lot of these short stories and you see Kim Il-sung in it or, or these characters glorifying Kim Il-sung, you have to look at the context of how they're glorifying it. Because sometimes these writers just kind of throw it in there. Because the censors say, well, you know what? You need to glorify the leader. Ah, all right, all right. I'll just put it in here. So if you read it, it's really strange because um, you know, two lovers will be in a coffee shop. They'll be drinking coffee. And they're talk they'll be talking about how they love each other and, and, and whatnot. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, Comrade Lee, Lee, do you know why this coffee tastes so great? <laughs> no, Comrade Kim. Why does this coffee taste so great? It's because of the great leader Kim Il Sung, who handpicked and roasted the. What are you kidding me right now? <laughs> and you have to you have to read it and you go, oh wow, wow, they just put it in anywhere. Right? So when you read through North Korean literature, that is what we need to look out for. So then what happened in 1970? So by 1967, things sort of changed in North Korea. The environment changed. And these writers were sort of forced to include Kim Il-sung in their stories. Okay. Well, Kim Jong-il announced the speed campaign. And here, Kim Jong-il wanted activity over quality. So quantity over quality. He wanted tons of short stories. Tons of films to be produced, tons of artworks to be produced in the 1970s. So writers and filmmakers are rushing to write these stories. They have a deadline to meet. And I know you guys are university students. Let's say if Professor Shin asked you to write 20 essays this semester. Uh, Number one, you would drop out of the class. But number two, uh, let's say you can't drop out of the class and you're forced to sit there and you have to write 20 essays. Uh, after like the seventh essay, it's gonna start looking the same as number five, essay number five. Essay number 13 will definitely look no the same as essay number 12. Not only that, your classmates are looking at each other, hey, what did you write about? <laughs> oh, I wrote about this, hey, let me see that and switch it. Just change the names. So a lot of this was happening in the 1970s. These writers had a deadline to meet. And at one point, so, so when I'm reading these, uh, uh, when I'm going through a uh, uh, Korean uh, literature journal, I see the same names over and over again. It's not because they love to write about Kim Il-sung. I guarantee my life, right, that is not what they wake up every morning for, right? They have a deadline to meet, and they're trying to meet that deadline. And you laugh about it, and I'm glad you laugh about it because uh, humor is something that we need in North Korea. And I'm looking at all these short stories, and you know, you do tend to laugh a little bit. Wow, you know, I can't believe they're writing this kind of story. Again, context. Context of the period and, and why they're writing this is important. Well, right around the 70s, North Koreans have a great sense of humor. Uh, they love their comedy films. And I remember as I was reading through all these short stories, my eyes were getting blurry, I was getting really disheartened. One of the librarians came up to me and said, hey, you want a good laugh? Yes, please. Here's a North Korean comedy film, made in 1973. I started watching it. Thought it was wonderful. I added subtitles to it, um, and I, I translated it as, my family's problem. My family's problem. Uh, in Korean, Uri means our, but it could also mean mine. Uh, North Korean, the way North Koreans uh, translate it is, uh, is um, the problem with my house. So they literally translated it, right? <laughs> the problem with my house. And I'm okay with that translation, but it's too literal. The problem with our house sounds like there's some kind of plumbing problem, right? Yeah. So uh, I decided, uh, it's, it's not going to be the problem with my house. It's going to be my family's problem. So I watched it. 
and I started doing my research. My second book is based on th that one film. My first book is based on Friend, the first novel up there. My second uh, book is on a North Korean comedy film is based on this particular film. Because what I see is the same actors, the same comedians coming out, and I'm like, oh, I recognize that guy. Oh, I recognize that woman. And then I started uh, cross-referencing, and I realized that in North Korea, the film industry, wow, it's so profound. And it's so, um, you know, it's so dynamic. My family's problem was the first of the series. There's, it's a 12-part series. Kim Jong-il did not like my family's problem. In fact, he hated it. He said this was a terrible film. So the writers, the filmmakers, went back, edited, showed him again, no. But the filmmakers went ahead and still made the film. And then Kim Jong-il saw the film and he said, this was terrible, I told you guys not to make this film. But, but the public response was excellent. So Kim Jong-il steps back and he goes, wait, the public demand, there's a public demand for this film. They loved it. So he goes, okay, I got an idea. We're gonna make a sequel. And pretty much gave it to the hands of the filmmakers to make the sequel, 12 part series. So My Family's Problem is the first of the series, and here is the list of the entire film series. Our next door neighbor's problem, our upstairs neighbor's problem, our downstairs neighbor's problem, our, wi uh, our wife's family's problem, our older brother's family's problem, our sister's family's problem, our in-law's family's problem, our younger brother's family problem. We are all one family. And when you thought that all the problems were resolved and there could not be any more problems, our family problem begins again. I've talked to so many uh, defectors, and I always ask, I, I don't really ask them, hey, how did you come over to South Korea? How tough was it crossing over? I, it's too traumatic for them, I don't want to bring that up again, so I don't really typically bring that up. But if they're of a certain age, especially if I know that they grew up in North Korea in the 70s and 80s, then I definitely ask this question, hey, what do you think about my family's problem? They love it. They love this series. And I'm glad you laughed because uh, I hope I demonstrated that North Koreans definitely have a good sense of humor. <laughs> that that you know, they know what to feed their people. That it's not just the party saying, hey, do this, and the filmmakers simply recite what the party says. Sure, there's an element of that. I'm not going to deny that. But there's another layer. In fact, a larger, deeper layer that shows North Koreans love to have fun. Their literature shows that, and their films certainly show that. Uh, I'll take questions at the end during the Q&A. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, there was a really wonderful introduction by uh, Dr. Shin, and also I was uh, totally amazed by the presentation uh, of uh, Dr. Kim's North Korean literature, which um, I never had any clue and idea about the Korean literature. Um, as I was introduced, I'm a visual artist, and I don't know why I happen to be in the North Korean art area field and uh, devote devoted uh, my life for the last eight years uh, without doing my own work. So I think it's, uh, it's my destiny. Um, maybe I hope this is good karma. <laughs> uh, anyway, let me start. North Korean art. Cho Sun Hwa is uh, a North Korean name for traditional ink wash painting on rice paper. And let me begin, um, uh, before I s really proceed this, and I was told that I have only 15 minutes to you know, talk about my presentation time. And I really enjoyed uh, um, Dr. King's presentation, and it took a really wild, and said, wow, I don't have that much. 
And uh, my presentation is really compact, and I just prepared it for this uh, evening's uh, event. Anyway, uh, let me show you a quick introduction of my research, how I got into uh, North Korea, uh, literally at the, their airport. This is uh, 2011. Um, their 9-9 celebration day, which means their, you know, the um, country's uh, establishing day. And then nowadays, it is very different. Uh, as you probably heard, um, Pompeo and the vegan, uh, vegan used this new airport, not like uh, 2011. And then this is a uh, Korea airline. I started uh, my trip uh, with the Korea airline and then I kept because I need to feel the fear of North Koreanness from the beginning. But there, she's so beautiful. And uh, so that knocked off my fear. That's really good. <laughs> this is the Daedong River. The red uh, letter is called the Pyongyang. And now I want to take a moment to uh, take you to the uh, institution where most of uh, famous North Korean artworks are created. Uh, there are numerous art studios throughout the nations, uh, even in the military. This is called the Mansude Art Studio, the biggest and most important one, of course, is supported by the government. And there are about 5,000 uh, artists that get together and work together in China uh, inside of uh, Beijing, but they're not really government uh, supported. So this is the, the biggest one, and uh, almost all very well-known North Korean artists that have studios inside. This is a brief de description of Mansude Art Studio. Uh, good quality art production uh, right in the uh, middle of Pyongyang. And now it's known as the Mansude Art Studio, uh, but it's actually the name uh, by Kim Jong-il in 1970s. Um, there are so many buildings and to altogether 29 acres. 10,000, I'm, I'm sorry, 1,000 artists and then 3,000 workers. How come that many workers in there? When they come to work in this studio, they bring their kids, and also they are all supporting members, including uh, bronze sculpture foundry, and all, all you know, cook, and uh, there are so many uh, supporting members there. And also, these, these artists are from, only from Pyongyang Art University. There are many art university level art institutions in entire nation, but only one art university exists in Pyongyang. It's called the Pyongyang Art University. They're very demanding to enter that. Um, and then there is a, a honorary people's uh, artist titles. It's called uh, Merit Artist and the people's artist, which is the highest. And there are about 13 departments. Of course, they have oil and acrylic paintings, and bronze and stone sculptures, and woodcut, and even embroidery is very, uh, considered a really important art form. And also, it's, it's called the gemstone power, uh, powder painting, it's very interesting. And then my major area of research is uh, Joseon Hwa. In North Korean art, Joseon Hwa ink wash painting on rice paper, we call it usually um, in our history, oriental painting. Joseon Hwa is considered the most significant, primal, and the main form of art in North Korea. They have a strong pride of this um, art form. Joseon means uh, Korea, particularly North Korea. Hwa means painting. And going back to this uh, first slide that I showed you, this is what Josona, typical Josona, contemporary Josona is. And the people who never seen North Korean art before, they probably remember something like this. 
These are uh, one of the street propagandas art with the slogans. If you visit North Korea, you'll see this in the streets, everyday life. And another uh, propaganda poster art. So, a lot of even experts in North Korean art, they call North Korean art all together, entire art kitsch, low-grade art. Because this kind of image is very strongly embedded in their, uh, I, their thoughts. But I want to emphasize that for the most part, Cho Sun Hwa shares the uh, uh, same propaganda themes with the poster art. But my emphasis will be on how North Koreans develop this uh, traditional medium of ink wash painting into a unique expression tool with a spur technical achievement. Very delicate touches. Now, you have to remember this is ink wash painting on rice paper, the extremely absorbing surface of paper. Young artist depicting uh, everyday life scene. When I show this slide, and there are many questions from audience. Che Chang Ho, who is the artist, is influenced by John Singer Sargent, which is a 19th, early 20th century, very famous American artist. No, not at all. But they can still do like this. I have many cases and examples how North Korean artists work passionately to improve their uh, and get the outcomes in the best way they can. But today I just wanted to show you only uh, one piece done by Kim in -sok. As you see the uh, uh, earlier version on the top, which has changed in uh, two major areas. As we, uh, uh, the, the complete painting on the bottom the far right and the far left sides are completely new, renewed. You see the two kids on the right side, and now it's very different. And the left side is very different as well. So this is the, uh, the finished one exhibited at the Gwangju Biennial uh, just last year in South Korea. And I chased this artist, Kim in -sup, for many years, this is a city earlier uh, version of his painting while he was uh, working on it, and see the scale, how big it is. Now, this piece is a legendary Chosona piece done by uh, Kim Son Min in uh, 1980. Um, it is a work in which uh, bold ink brush strokes uh, move, move uh, effervescently. A masterpiece of the 70 year history of North Korean Chosona that exudes, smears the uh, so called the Mogu style of uh, spontaneous depiction with the ink to produce yet very three dimensional quality. I have to tell you that within the scope of South Korean and Chinese art history in Oriental painting, it is the greatest figurative uh, painting that I have ever seen. As an artist, I can say that the brush strokes are vigorous, spontaneous, and almost uh, violent at some point. Yet, you see this delicate facial expressions of inner emotions of these uh, smelters whose labor was at that time under Japanese colonial exploitation. And I met this artist in Pyongyang at Mansdor studio. Uh, this shows that uh, my research method, mostly on-site, first-hand approach is what I took. Cha chang -ho, who is the, the leading Chosona painting of uh, the artist, he is well known with this again, the Mogu. It's a boneless 
painting technique. Boneless means that uh, it came from Chinese um, oriental painting term. Bone in the Chinese calligraphy or oriental calligraphy is a stroke. And when you apply the stroke in the oriental painting, it is outline. So his painting style is there is no outline. As you see here, there's no outline anywhere in his uh, uh, depiction of uh, his worker. Um, I think it's really interesting to show, although it's very brief and superficial, to compare two countries' different path of development in oriental painting, especially in the figurative work. The south on the left took a dry and detailed linear expression approach called gongdi, or in Korean gongpil, using really fine brushes. And the uh, plane for the skin tone is uh, filled with a simple uh, tonality of light and the dark colors in a soft smearing technique called the damche. While the north on the right, as we saw the uh, full figure, has delved into more poetic approach and emphasis of a three-dimensionality with uh, eminent brush strokes. These brush strokes often express vigor and abstraction as shown in this painting. Now, if you look at the, uh, the bottom part of their clothes, the treatment of the clothes here, the upper South Korean painting is created with uh, mostly outlines, while the lower North Korean Chosuna is composed with a vigorous brush stroke. I think that is the abstract quality in brush strokes in the realist expression of the Chosuna is uh, quite an ivory because they don't do abstraction at all in North Korea. They know the existence of uh, abstract art out there, but they don't do it. You know why the reason? They said, I asked Che chang have you heard about abstract art? Yes. And how come you're not interesting? Because it doesn't relate to our own people's sentiment because it's not poetic. That's his answer was so, so striking. Uh, anyway, um, in Che chang case, uh, it can be more closely compared to a contemporary British master whose name is Lucian Freud, who passed away a few years ago. Lucian Freud, of course, as you see here, tactile surface means so thickly applied, many layers of oil painting. On the other hand, the other hand the Cho Sun Hwa artist cannot really put the layers and layers of colors. Paper is so thin and it smears into it, so you have to control really well the one shot at a time, that's it. So it demands a lot of technical uh, skillful approach. And I would like to show you a few examples of a landscape painting done in Chosun Ha. Son Uyeong, Jung Chang Mo, they are very different. Depicting same Mount Kumgang, we just saw uh, this image is, is a part of a uh, depiction of Mount Kumgang and this Done by Che Chang Ho approaches his subject in quite a different way from previous two artists. His work stirs up the uh, dormant energy. That's how I feel within the human spirit. It's almost like almost like a ghostly image. There, it's so powerful, so violent. Is sometimes <coughs> now it's so interesting. It is uh, the similar view of a Mount Kumgang done by his teacher, Jung Young Man. Now I can compare these two. And Jung Young Man, as a teacher of Che Chang Ho, used to say to Che to create work different and distinct from expressions of other artists. That is uh, totally different from what our general assumption of North Korean artists' idea and approach to their own work. 
So they already try to express very differently to each other. If they are really rushed, like uh, uh, Dr. Kim said, you know, during the 70s, do a lot of work, a deadline, they probably do very fast and then come up with this very similar work. But in this case, they have a, a, a monthly homework. It's not really number of uh, pieces they have to finish, but the quality work. Certain artists can do three pieces a month, and other artists maybe can do five or 10. So after that, they take the time, and they devote themselves to do really serious work. So this piece is something like that. The result, the top one is the result of that uh, long process of uh, working. One powerful aspect of North Korean art is the unique work mode of collaboration in all media, including painting and sculpture. And in Joseon Hwa, ink wash painting on rice paper is typically very, very interesting. Um, it's usually done to commemorate, commemorate an event such as this. Um, when the Kim Il-sung died in 1994, in 1996, the entire Chosona artist of Mansude art studio, 60 of them, came together passionately, day and night, worked in a few months. 40 feet, this one piece is 40 feet, but this is only one section of many, many different uh, scenes, sceneries, and peoples involved. So it depicts the morning of Kim Il-sung's death in 1994. Four artists did this. Amazing expression of waves in the ocean. This scene is actually North Korean fishermen rescuing South Korean fishermen. They're in wreck. And of course, they didn't make this story. This is actual, and never, never uh, explained in South Korea. It's kind of a shameful for the South Koreans. This depicts Imjin War uh, broke out in 1950. Uh, I mean, 1592 in Joseon Dynasty. Four artists completed this. I have to keep. Reminding you that this is done on rice paper, ink wash, painting. Seven artists did this collaborative painting. And I have to tell you, they love, just like uh, uh, Dr. Kim described, they love uh, the uh, studying melodrama, rich with the humanity. This kind of things, you know, they want to include in their pictures. It's a very narrative quality. We call it in the contemporary art outside of North Korea, America, Europe, anywhere, Japan, South Korea. Nobody would do this kind of storytelling image. Call it very kitsch, but I love this one. This very melodramatic aspect of art, which we look upon down and, hey, what's wrong with you? This is our life. So when you go home, you cry, you laugh, make love. This is part of the life. They love to depict this. Six artists did uh, this collaborative painting. And again, here. This is a very propaganda look. But if you visit North Korea, if you have a chance to go to the work site, when they have a chance, when they have a break time, they play music, they laugh about, they joke about all the dirty jokes. <laughs> That's the way they, you know, they, uh, bring their energy up. So this is a very propaganda art, but to try to encourage themselves <coughs> to produce more great effort, great result. A 
another collaborative painting. With my all this research last six years, um, I first had, I was able to uh, pull things together at the wonderful North Korean art at the American University Museum in Washington, D.C. This is the first North Korean art exhibition with only Cho Son Hwa and lots of collaborative paintings. And then I'm going to show you just past year, Gwangju Biennial, the title North Korean Art Paradoxical Realism. This was one of the main sections of Gwangju Biennial show display. This is the first opportunity for the people around the world to see North Korean art in the full spectrum within the context of a socialist realism. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, North Korea remains the only country, it's a so fascinating idea, that truly continues to produce socialist realism artwork. And my mission is, I'm going to put this in the contemporary art history. Hey, guys, art historians, don't forget North Korean art. Still going on. This is a socialist realism art, especially done in Joseon Fascinating. Another view. I also uh, wanted to include in this show so called the literary painting, traditional nobleman's painting. And it drew so many visitors, record of uh, visitors last year, while the uh, declining uh, rate of the uh, visitors uh, for the Gwangju Biennial, because of North Korean art show, they have to boost it up quite a lot. And at the same time, Asai Shimbun in Japan, Washington Post, so interesting. September 18th, Washington Post, and you look at the lower left side, Moon Jae-in of South Korea, Kim Jong-un of North Korea, doing car parade in Pyongyang. Same day, whole page coverage of North Korean art show for the Gwangju Biennial. This is a phenomenon. And in conjunction with the uh, Biennial, I wrote this book and uh, another book that uh, Dr. Shin um, introduced. So, as I promised, my presentation should be within 15 minutes. I usually do a one hour presentation, but um, I think that's good enough for tonight. Thank you. So uh, my question um, is um, this. Uh, uh, so uh, 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 to Professor Moon first, uh, in your book, uh, you said uh, you were arrested and investigated by um, FBI, FBI uh, while you were doing uh, the research. And uh, uh, it was not completely unimaginable. Uh, I think you went through uh, many problems uh, while you were doing uh, your research. Uh, so uh, uh, what could you tell us a little more about what made you uh, continue to devote your, you know, energy and uh, uh, and life uh, to uh, a research on North Korean painting? Okay, uh, let me correct the Dr. Shin's 
first part of the question. I was not arrested by FBI, but I was questioned by FBI. <laughs> uh, it was uh, kind of a really scary moment when they sent me an email that they want to see me. Instead of just uh, raid my house and arrest me, they gently sent me an email, but still I didn't like that. You know, <laughs> by FBI, and I was not sure these guys are genuine FBI or just kind of uh, try to threat me or something. So, of course, the whole, my family was uh, really scared. You know. <laughs> my wife said, what did you do wrong? <laughs> I told you not to do that. <laughs> Why did you go to North Korea? You know, questions like that. Uh, and then I told this story to my students. Said, oh, Professor Moon, please don't go alone when you were investigated you know, by uh, the, these two uh, these FBI guys. Can we go along with you? <laughs> <laughs> so it really bothered me and scared me. So. Uh, I thought about, contemplated for about a week. Did I do anything wrong, first of all? Against America's interest? Or I did something for the interest of North Korea? So I analyzed all my activities and behaviors. And so, well, there's nothing that I really have to worry about. It is everything is a uh, cultural and scholarly research, right? So, okay, without telling my family, I told them, okay, let's see each other, but come to my school. So they came to my school, so we met at one of the uh, empty classrooms. The question was actually, it's, uh, it's very interesting. At that time, there's a big um, incident happened. Uh, American Air Force officers' email was uh, hacked by North Korean hackers, and uh, many email addresses was used. So mine was one of them. Uh, so that's that's why they wanted to see me. Okay. So when they got there, that they showed me their badge, and they, but who would really thoroughly check their badges, right? Okay, okay, because you are already, you know, it's kind of a, under the pressure of being uh, investigated. So anyway, I told them, okay, look, you guys already know what I've been doing, right? But I'm gonna tell you uh, what I have done. So I explained briefly, but some with some details. And they said, okay, if anything happens to you uh, with the North Korean, you know, or whatever, and let us know. So that's fine. So that was the answer of uh, uh, Dr. Shin's first question. And the second question uh, is really, um, I sometimes ask to myself, and I already said something, you know, why, why have I been doing this? So crazy. You know, visiting North Korea one time from America, especially the East Coast side, only one time. First of all, physically, you have a complete change of you know, time zone. 12 noon here is at 12 midnight over there. So you have a severe jet lag, at least for a, a week for me. And then, uh, where and tear physical and psychologically, it is uh, <laughs> me and myself grew up in South Korea with the heavy anti communist education that I had. Oh my god, it's just, you know, even though I'm an American citizen, the uh, fear is enormous. And then, I, most of the time, that I went there alone to do my research. So, after several times of uh, visiting, I'm, I'm actually altogether nine times, but visit, several times of visiting, and I asked myself, am I crazy or something? And nobody really supported my research. 
So this is all from my credit card, you know, my wife didn't like that. Um, and then I realized later, uh, look, there are nobody, even in South Korean art historians or European art historians who are keenly interested in North Korean art, nobody's doing what I've been doing, like on-site, first-hand research. So, the, am I a brave person? No. I mean, like a child-like? Yes. So I do have that, uh, you know, characteristic in my, deep in my heart. And um, uh, anyway, so to get to the uh, uh, Dr. Shin's question, I felt, after several times of the trip, I felt this really strongly that, okay, this is my, not just a desire, this is my duty. As a person who was born in the Korean Peninsula, happened to be in America, happened to be a visual artist who can analyze artwork and who discovered North Korean art, nobody really pays attention, feels that so great. He loves the melodramatic essence of the North Korean art. So this is my destiny. I have to do this. And then I have to make a North Korean art as a socialist realism ongoing phenomenon in art history. That's why I devoted myself the last uh, eight years of doing this. Thank you very much for your uh, answer. Uh, this time I want to ask a little more serious question. Uh, this question is for uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kim. Uh, I also think you uh, went through some uh, difficult moments uh, in figuring out what you uh, wanted to do with uh, North Korean uh, literature. You mentioned the an episode, uh, you read so many uh, you know, short stories, uh, you were frustrated and you went to your mentor and he said, be patient with North Korean literature. I mean, I think uh, that uh, you said uh, in your book uh, that was a simple but profound advice you could get from your mentor. And uh, I also think uh, being patient with uh, North Korean literature is uh, very important. And uh, in your book, uh, you said uh, uh, even though uh, some, you know, uh, Western scholars went to uh, North Korea, uh, the uh, majority of them uh, ended up accusing North Korean literature for being a part of, uh, you know, the propaganda machine. Uh, but uh, you uh, seem to suggest that. Uh, Many North Korean experts have, in fact, been partaking in the anti-North Korean propaganda that reproduced monochromatic view over and over again, which is lacking in creativity and uh, imagination. But at the same time, you said uh, your project is not to find in text opposing voices or hidden messages critical of the great leader. I think that's where your uh, you know, research uh, has become very subtle. You are not trying to find uh, anti uh, you know, Kim Jong Un or anti Kim Il Sung messages um, hidden somewhere in uh, those literary texts, but uh, you are also critical of uh, the simplistic uh, you know, accusation of North Korean literature as uh, you know, for being a part of the propaganda. So, um, can you tell a little more about uh, the, you know, uh, your uh, effort to find uh, the middle ground between those two uh, views? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. It's something that I struggle with a lot because um, on the one hand, people have asked me if there is such a literature that criticizes the state, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there are these dissident writers in North Korea who will one day emerge, come out, 
of the woodworks and um, publish outside of North Korea. I mean, there is a there is a story, a, a collection of stories, by a, a, an anonymous North Korean, or supposedly anonymous North Korean writer by the name of Bandol, who wrote the accusation, and it's been translated into English as well. Um, and they thought that people would really you know, go crazy over that book because, wow, finally a dissident literature from North Korea. They thought it was going to have the same effect as like in the Soviet Union when they pulled it out or from East Germany and whatnot. But it didn't, actually. People just kind of forgot about this book. And what they're really looking for is still the same literature that is produced today in North Korea, the, the whole propaganda uh, literature. Uh, yeah, for, so for me, I'm not reading in between the lines in terms of, ooh, if they say this, are they actually criticizing the leader? I'm not going to go that far. I'm not going to push it that far. Right? My project is not to see what these authors are possibly saying about the government or whatnot. No, I think these authors uh, are doing what, what they know best, and that is they know their community, they know their neighborhood, they know their um, workplace, they know their uh, environment. And it's an everyday problem for them. It's an everyday problem for North Koreans on a daily basis, right? Um, and so, for example, when you watch the, the TV show The Office and you see Steve Carell going crazy and being an idiot, I'm not going to make that connection and say, therefore, Steve Carell is representing Donald Trump. I'm not going to do that, right? To me, that's ridiculous. This is an everyday middle management that we run into and we say, oh my god, my managers, right? They're, they're so, oh, right? This is the frustration and, and, and the tension that North Koreans face every day. And it doesn't have to always be about the leaders. So when scholars look at literature and they automatically connect this to the larger state, to the government, to the, lead, uh, the great leaders of North Korea, to me that's a big jump, right? And for me, I'm not sure if I want to make that jump. Uh, because number one, it could be there, it may not be there, I, but I'm not going to be the one that makes that connection. And number two, um, I don't see the purpose of connecting you know, uh, cultural pr products like literature, film, artwork, and automatically tying that to the greater state. Like, I I'm not sure if it always connects it to the bigger state. Right? Um, just because they're state employees doesn't mean that every literature that they produce had in mind the entire country, right? I mean, they, they, if you talk to them, they might say that, oh, yeah, this is for our country, right? So, yeah, okay, right. We know political rhetoric, right? But, um, no, they're basing their story based on uh, everyday occurrences, and that's what, I'm exa what I am examining, the everyday life of North Koreans. Yes, Right, so uh, now uh, we are opening the discussion to the audience, so uh, I will uh, receive the questions. Yeah. So my question is for Dr. Kim, who I can't see. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you, you teased us with the family problem as being this, this film that North Koreans who grew up in the 70s and 80s in this department, but you didn't tell us what it was about. For the situation. So my question is two part. One, can you tell us about what the film uh, does that makes it funny? You know, what's the situation or what makes it funny? And in the process, could you also illuminate us about what uh, is distinctive about Korean North Korean humor? Sure. That's a good question. Uh, first of all, my family's problem is about a husband who's trying to do his job for the state, he's a state employee, but his wife continues to interrupt him. So that's what it is. that's the basic premise. Uh, in the end, uh, they get humiliated. That's about it. Uh, now, part two, the husband and wife they keep coming. They they are the main characters, so they keep coming out. They uh, and then they travel to. Or, you know, all over, and they resolve other people's problems. Now, other people's problems could be about um, one of them was raising their teenage kid who was just not listening to the parents. Right. Uh, another one is about um, sending their daughter abroad because she wants to live that kind of European life. Um, problems with that, and how you shouldn't 
you shouldn't look to like lavishness. You should just be a very uh, humble person. All kinds of problems. Uh, but in the end, all of these problems are somewhat very similar to what we face anywhere. Uh, so these aren't unusual or, or particular to North Korea. The humor is very interesting now. Uh, they do not have slapstick. They look at slapstick as being very cheap humor. On the other hand, they love Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> so I don't see, there's a bit of a paradox there. How can you love Charlie Chaplin, the, the god of slapstick, and say slapstick is not funny? Um, so they, they do a lot of wordplay. They do a lot of humorous scenes. So the, the, the scene is, is humorous, um, but it's, they avoid like sexual uh, innuendos. Um, and so when, when a lot of people watch North Korean comedy films, they don't find it funny. Uh, but that's not because North Koreans are not funny. It's just, I think it's a different cultural code. Right? Um, so for example, like my, my parents, when I showed, my, especially my father, who is a staunch anti-communist man, grew up in the 40s and 50s in, in South Korea, lived through the Korean War, hates North Korea with a passion. And I showed him this movie, he thought it was the funniest thing. Uh, then again, for example, like uh, I, I enjoy watching uh, a Korean comedy show called Gag Concert. It's still on today. I love watching it, but my brother doesn't get it, for example. So, is it because gag concert uh, is not funny? No, it's just because my brother just doesn't get it. Right? He doesn't understand the cultural innuendos in the, in the jokes. Likewise, for North Korean uh, film as well, it's not because they're not funny. In fact, they're very funny. It's just you have to understand that time period, that culture, and so forth. Right? So, um, no, I find, I find their uh, humor to be uh, uh, great, actually. Uh, very... Um, very simple, and, and there's nothing uh, crass about it, there's nothing gross, there's nothing sexual about it, it's just pure jokes. Okay, yeah. Um, I just want to thank both of you uh, for your really wonderful presentations. I mean, I think it, I think both of your work um, highlights in, in very, very strong ways the value, of course, of scholarship and of what scholars are able to bring to the table because, of course, normally when most Americans um, think about North Korea, you know, we just think of nukes, right? <laughs> this is all we hear when we think about North Korea, you know, these weapons that are they're launching off or, or they're hacking somebody or they're, you know, if you, if you read a little bit more deeply, maybe you find out about these statues that North Korea is helping to build in certain African countries or what have you, or they're selling weapons, you know, so these are the things you hear about, right? You don't hear about all this amazing, amazing cultural production that uh, both of you have shown us, and so I, I, I thank you for that. Um, uh, starting with uh, Professor uh, Moon, uh, so I'm, you you kind of hinted a little bit at this, and sort of like this, uh, you know, so this Zhou Song Hua. So you know, when thinking about the larger category of Oriental painting, so I'm wondering, is there? I guess probably there isn't anyone. I was going to say, is there anyone doing this comparison? And it's probably you. Is there anyone that can do uh, the comparison between like this, the modern Oriental painting between what's going on in North Korea? versus what's going on in China, Japan, South Korea, because I, I have some understanding of Chinese. Uh, I, I'm a Chinese historian, not a art historian, so my knowledge about art history is very limited, but you know, contemporary Chinese art, there is, they've sort of moved away from the, the traditional sort of rice paper, right? I mean, they're more mimicking, it seems to me, more of the Western oil painting, and so you don't see a lot within Chinese art today, this usage of, of rice paper and you know and use and, um, and using the sort of like a different sort of um, uh, subject matter, right? Because traditionally, of course, Oriental arts is your landscape paintings or you know maybe you paint a scholar or something like this. But here you're showing us um, using traditional styles but using a very modern subject matter, which for me I think is just is just phenomenal. And not only is it phenomenal, but it's just so amazingly 
done. I mean, the quality is just tremendous. I mean, I have a lot of questions in terms of distribution. Are they getting paid like more? Like if their work is like really hot, uh, you know, that'd be very interesting. It's very interesting. One of the pieces, uh, can they buy MacBooks? In, I, I think I saw a MacBook <laughs> in one of your paintings. Uh, that was kind of interesting. Um, and, and to Professor Gim, like, so I'm just thinking about, um, you know, these, uh, all of these different uh, short stories and, and what have you. And I think it's, it's right to point out that, yes, I mean, what's important is not to be trying to find the distant and, you know, these, these are just very, very real, real stories. So you mentioned that you might sort of uh, talk about dissemination. So how, how are these, uh, like, stories getting about? Uh, I mean, are they, uh, are they very large print runs? Um, you know, are, are there sort of book signing, um, you know, things? How commercialized um, is, is some of this? Um, yeah, so we can start there, I guess. Yeah. I guess uh, you are very right. We are doing great. <laughs> <laughs> Nukes, right. Yeah. Uh, Gulag, yeah. Uh, those are true, yeah. and also, what we have been doing is discovering undiscovered areas of their culture, which is great. So let me tell you, uh, since I'm a, a contemporary artist, let me tell you about this brief description of art nowadays. What we see is art fair, uh, biennials, including uh, Venice biennials and you know, Guggenheim biennials. Those are the biggest uh, you know, exhibitions. Um, and then so many uncountable numbers of individual shows everywhere. It's not in New York only, Pittsburgh, Japan, Tokyo, Osaka, Taiwan, European countries, any cities, humongous, a lot of activities, and you don't see oriental painting at all, right? That's very true. But another truth is it lies if you go see oriental painting society in each country. They produce a whole lot of big, energetic amount of artwork, taking tradition, giving education, doing exhibitions. Those activities and energies not simply shown in the international market because it's not considered contemporary art art, right? But nobody really disgraced the quality of their art. But it's simply it's not seen all those art fairs and you know biennials, uh, New York contemporary solo shows, right? So in China, for instance, it's called the uh, or simply Koha means national painting, just like North Koreans call that Chosunhua, it's a North Korean painting. So respected as well as their traditional calligraphy on rice paper. Even the famous uh, Beijing's Central Art Academy, the most famous art university, they have a calligraphy section students uh, majoring in. So the tradition comes along and exist, will continue, but simply it's not on the surface. If you go to South Korea, Japan, same thing happened, same thing happens. So a lot of people still doing that. And then a lot of young generation who is using same medium, ink wash on rice paper, they are taking more contemporary approach. Instead of depicting only landscape or figure, they doing abstract art, they mixed media. So still those trend is considered not the major art scene in contemporary art. 
Right. And uh, I, I know you have the question about, you know, the market of Chosonwa, you know, how people you know, buy those pieces. Yes. It's very active, very expensive. Yeah, in terms of dissemination, um, so on the back of the novel, most novels will have a number um, of, of how many uh, of the novels have been printed. So the most I've ever seen was 100,000. So we're not talking about a huge publication. We're not talking about a huge um, circulation of these books. Um, the more political and propaganda the novel is, there will be more reprints of it. So 100,000 is quite a lot. So I, I, before reading the book, I would always look in the back and look at how many uh, times uh, or how many publications there are. If it's 100,000, I tend to put it right back on the shelf because that's a very political propaganda, very typical <laughs> type of, no, I don't want to read that stuff. <laughs> And if the lowest one I've seen is like 5,000. So then, if I see a 5,000 one, I'm like, oh, why did they not publish this as many? Huh. And then I start reading it, and then it gets really interesting. Right? Um, there's a yearly almanac that, pub uh, that says, all right, this year we published so many, so many novels and so many short stories, uh, but we recommend, the party recommends you reading these stories. I tend to stay away from those. Whatever the party recommends, I stay away from right? um, so then, how do I do this? Well, word of mouth. I've realized North Korea works on word of mouth. There's no good advertising system, there's no good commercial system, so it's a word of mouth. Uh, in North Korea, people are reading everywhere. A friend of mine, Sonia Rang, when she visited North Korea in the 80s, she realized everyone was reading on the streets. Uh, these days, people are still reading, but on their mobile phones. Right. So they're reading uh, either the newspaper or the short story or the daily joke. I've seen that. The daily joke. The joke of the day. Right? They're, whatever it is, they're reading. Um, I, I see people reading in the elevators. And uh, one of the anecdotes that I really enjoy is uh, going back uh, to the novel Friend. Uh, the author, Bing Nam Yong, was, was on a bus. And he looked over and he, he saw a woman reading his novel. But the novel was all tattered because it was circulated from friend, neighbors, blah, 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 circulated among themselves. So he was so intrigued. He looked over to the woman and said, listen, I will get you a new copy if you would give me that copy. Because he wanted to keep it as like, like a souvenir. She thought he was crazy. <laughs> what a, who is this guy asking me? So she got off. But she was buried. She buried her face in, in, the, in the novel because it's so good. Um, so yeah, it's circulated among friends. It, it, so it, it, information doesn't go fast. Um, and quite honestly, you know, my son hates reading novels. I think North Koreans, especially the, the younger generation, they don't want to sit there and read a 500-page novel. I don't, this is just not appealing. They rather look at their mobile phones, right? So I don't think the society is any different today. I think uh, it's time to wrap up uh, today's event because it's already past uh, 8. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I really want to ask uh, Professor Moon uh, this question. Uh, so uh, I uh, hope uh, you know, Professor Moon uh, can give us a um, you know, brief answer to this question. I really, I'm really wondering why um, uh, socialist realism is uh, so very important in North Korean painting, while uh, that term uh, has become outdated in many other societies. So uh, you said uh, socialist realism was important in the past, and actually it still blooms in uh, North Korean painting. Mm -hmm. And, but uh, that term uh, has become an outdated term in many other societies. So why do we think uh, you know, that uh, term is important for North Korean painters or North Korean art in general? Um, it is a very, to me, very natural to keep that uh, term as an uh, art movement in North Korea. As you probably know, socialist realism has begun 1930s in the Soviet Union, and uh, by the time Soviet Union falls, 
fell, then you know the uh, movement uh, completely uh, moved away uh, from uh, our history. That's what I don't like because, uh, as I said, as I showed you, those activities, those energy done by North Korean artists, not only Joseon Hwa, but oil paintings, acrylic paintings, all sculptures, uh, flourish still at its high speed and high peak. And they are doing just great. Okay, now your question. It is outdated, truly outdated, because most of countries, not socialist countries, socialist realism art is made within socialist countries. Those days, it's communist countries. But socialist, one of the socialist countries, I just visited Canada, uh, three days ago, they call their country socialist country, but they're not really socialist country. Economy, yes, they collect a large tax and then try to distribute more to the people uh, equally. In that sense, it's a socialist country. I'm not sure I agree with the system, but you know, people live in that country, they kind of adapted the system and live fine there, but nowadays, true socialist country, which actually became from communist countries, the only North Korea. China is not in that category anymore. Cuba is not in that category anymore. A certain amount of freedom, or quite a lot of freedom is given to the people. North Korea is not like that. So, when you look at Soviet Union's art from 1930s and up, up until 1990s, it is, we call it socialist realism art period. And Ruth Korea is exactly doing that type of work these days. So, it doesn't matter, it is outdated, but we have to respect because they are do, still doing it. And it's a, to me, it's a big irony. Irony of the system. Without that strict, confined system, we don't see that kind of work. Because all free countries, they don't really desire to express that way. So it is a big paradox called realism. That's what I call the uh, the Kwangju Biennial. Big irony. So, I guess to answer your question is, it is very important to that country, that system, but all other systems outside of North Korea, they don't really uh, have the same system. But their art is still going on.